Hello, welcome to the panel on the Roaring Twenties. Um, I'm here with uh, some amazing panelists, new friends of mine, and we are going to have a uh, as much as possible an unchoreographed conversation this time. My, my experience uh, in the past, which was entirely my fault um, at Horasis, was to try and choreograph some of the answers, and I'd really like to tap into the, the collective intelligence of this uh, amazingly talented pool of uh, of individuals, visionaries. Um, so we have Karen Harris here, MD at Macro Trends for Bain. Uh, Alistair Hicks, uh, a writer and art curator. Uh, Simone Kimpler, uh, Director of For uh, Foresight at the Fraunhofer Institute. Hopefully I've not butchered the name too much uh, in Germany. Um, Stuart. Hutton from um, the CIO of Simply Ethical. And soon um, we should have uh, Edward Schenderich, uh, who is currently in the audience, and we're trying to figure out how to get him on the stage. So we're working behind the scenes uh, to, to get Edward on, on, on stage. And I know he's got some amazingly um, interesting insights about the future uh, from a technological perspective. And we had a, an amazing conversation about the future of cities a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, me personally, my name's Benjamin J. Butler. Uh, I'm an independent futurist, but uh, I'm also futurist for Horasis. Um, and uh, I work with a number of um, institutions and write in a book at the moment called The Futurist, uh, a dialogue about the future uh, between uh, two characters, a bit like uh, Sophie's world for the future. Um, so um, I've done a panel some time ago, which was called the Tumultuous Twenties, uh, because that was my view. I, I thought we'd have some pretty uh, big zigs and zags through this decade. Um, and it did start in an interesting way with locusts in Africa, the assassination of a, an Iranian general, COVID, and, and God knows what else uh, in the, the early um in the first three months of, of 2020. Uh, but today it's the roaring 20s. So let's see if my fe fellow panelists are as excited by the title. Um, and just, I don't know if I've got it here. Um, I don't have the write up in front of me, but uh, we've all read it. Um, and we, uh, in the write up, there were some similarities drawn between the the, the, the 20s of 100 years ago, post, obviously, the Spanish influenza and, and world war. So, fellow panelists, does it mean that after all the creative destruction of the last year and a half, we're about to have the roaring 20s again? Um, or was my previous panel correct? And we're going to get the tumultuous 20s. So, um I don't know who would like to kick off, perhaps Karen, as I've got your name at the top of this p piece of paper, whether you'd like to have your first stab at, um, at the title of this uh, uh, panel. Sure, thank you. Um, as a, as a, a surname H, I rarely end up being stuck at the front. So I suppose after a lifetime of being comfortably in the middle, I, I deserve some payback. Um, uh, it's, I look at this largely from sort of the economic, social, geopolitical perspective. And while there are definitely some uh, similarities to the Roaring Twenties, I think uh, you know, it, once you've been flat on your face, uh, getting up, is it, it looks astounding, uh, like astounding progress. Um, I do, I, I do get concerned about what some of the consequences are of of the era that we've just gone through. And what's interesting about the Roaring Twenties is, at least from my perspective, when I look at where that sat in a sort of secular way, it really sat in the middle of a long cycle of trends moving from agriculture to industry in many uh, developed markets between the two wars, the development of, of currency systems, uh, the uh, 
the propulsion of labor uh, through capital, all of those things were underway, the movement of people, the beginning of, 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 of a different type of home living as machinery and automation moved into homes in the earliest senses. The automobile had just taken off, for example. I, I think when I look at this decade, I see it more as the beginning of a uh, of, of the next set of uncertain secular trends. And when I think about what some of those are, some of the tectonic forces changing the world, I think about the fact that we've gone through a multi-decadal period of a growing labor pool, where the in, first the movement, the baby boomers after the war coming into the workforce, the integration of women into the workforce in large numbers starting in the 70s, and then most importantly, the integration of China into that global work pool. Uh, all of that meant that we had labor superabundance, that the cost of labor went down, that supply chains extended around the world. And today we're seeing those work pools either grow dramatically less quickly in some of the Anglo countries or in fact shrink in China and Germany, the most important exporters. Really only India has a labor pool at scale. Uh, I, I know people will think Africa, but Africa of course is 54 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's not what I would consider at scale. Um, so we're seeing now the, with the advancement of technology, another wave of substitution of technology for labor, in this case, in things like the service sector, very different dynamic than we've seen. We saw a massive growth in global capital pools that may decline as baby boomers pull out savings, as countries become more nationalistic and, and borders close. We may see the another cycle of globalization end that tends to come in cycles as well. We already see rising nationalism and the movement towards blocks that's accelerated by uh, a digital system where there are very different values, whether the internet should be, in China's view, sovereign uh, territory defended like physical territory or a more European view of it being a public common where there are protections for individuals, but ultimately Ultimately, it's the right of individuals. So when I stack those up against the Roaring Twenties, it's easy to be seduced by the idea of growing growth. And we may well see a supply side boom, but the left behind middle class from the growing labor pools, the technological disruption, the changes in the fundamental tectonics of the economy strike me. Uh, I, I'd put my vote more toward the tumultuous than the roaring uh, point of view, though, of course, there'll be some big winners coming up. Wonderful. Thank, thanks, Karen. Um, uh, I was going to invite uh, Simone to speak next, but she's helping me get Edward uh, onto the on the panel. Hopefully the support team, if they're listening, please help us out because um, uh, it's tricky to moderate. I can. And, well, wonderful. Oh, you're, okay. Would love okay, to invite so, you now in. Yes, I, I actually, I, I was not very successful in reaching somebody from the help desk, but instead I figured out that as far as I understood the instructions, um, I would like now to ask Edward to use this, grab the mic, he, which he already tried. So maybe uh, this should work. Okay, I will... Um now he he has requested the mic, and now he should have it. Edward, can you speak to us? Oh, yes, this works. Oh, great, solved. <laughs> oh, wonderful, great. Isn't this full, technology wonderful? Full team. Uh, well, um, how, can you, how can you speak about tumultuous 20s when, uh, uh, when uh, technology is such a savior? Well, I'm really looking forward to your very bullish remarks, because I loved our conversation the other day. Um, but uh, uh, on, based on my conversations earlier in the week, um, I want to get Simone's take um, before we move move on to technology and other issues. Maybe, I don't know whether you've decided to draw on your experiences with Germany 100 years ago or what track you've decided to go down. But yeah, would would love yes. to get your impressions. Yes, thank you. Actually, I cannot speak of my personal experiences with Germany 100 years ago. But uh, <laughs> what happens is that uh, we have a little revival of Berlin of the 20s in movies and in uh, re-reading novels of that period, also from people from a 
abroad who traveled to Berlin at that time, journalists from Britain, for example, who, who were, wrote fantastic novels about the time. And they went there because they were able to live free there, which, uh, which was not possible in under, other parts of Europe or of the world. Um, and why, why is this, why is this so fascinating again is one question. I would like to raise, which I cannot answer. Uh, is it only nostalgia or is there also something which is of interest today compared to our situation today? Because we are now also discussing once again um, new ways of integration, uh, of societal uh, integration, of, of understanding of diversity in our um, society. Uh, because gay people, for example, they moved to Berlin because this was a place where they can move freely. They could go out at night, everything, without being, you know, um, observed uh, in, in smaller cities somewhere else. Uh, and I would like to, um, I would like to follow the path uh, which has been started, uh, be talking about the women. Uh, because for women, as Karen said, it was the same thing that during the first world war, they had to take over men's roles to keep the system running and make a living. And after the war was over, many of them did not return to their former lives. And many of the women had to start, um, well, uh, they were forced actually to become financially independent because they lost their husbands and families and And they had to move somewhere else, have to start somewhere else. So they took new roles. And this helped a bit uh, to crumble the old social order, at least in some of the, um, at some regions uh, in Europe. And um, which is something which I found very interesting when I tried to figure out if there's a comparison to other regions in the world. I realized that there are some studies My background is communication studies, and now I'm in foresight. But I realized that there is a lot of work in in uh, uh, comparative analysis, uh, literature, movies, art, um, about the period 1920s as the first historically really serious cross-national and cross-class attempt by millions of women to step out of the shadow of men. And so I would like to... Um, end my, my little introduction by saying uh, what has been reached and what where are we now? <laughs> so it, it's what? not that everything has changed since then, but some things have and some things are again uh, discussed. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Simone. Um, I think as you brought up culture, cultural trends and, and alluded to art, perhaps um, um, our in-house expert, Alistair, who I know is incredibly well-read beyond uh, art uh, as well. Um, um, we were talking about uh, Sir Francis Bacon the other day, a hero of mine. Um, what, what, um, what are your thoughts on the idea of a, um, the, the, the rest of the decade, the roaring 20s? Yeah, I'd love to take on from where Simone has been talking about uh, 20s in, in Berlin. Uh, but first of all, before I sound too negative, I'd like to say... Um, I I do love a good roar. I'm not against roaring, and I, if anyone's out there going to invite me to a party, I'm I, I'm longing for the day when we get to the parties. So I'm not against. And um, although I think we're not in a totally similar situation to the 1920s, uh, there are quite a few comparisons, but the. The pandemic in the 1919 was far, far worse than the one we've gone through. The numbers were astronomically higher and much crueler to women. They wiped out many more women than, than men. Um, so, um, but why I'm born is that I think the present time, despite the commentary in the press, that has seen a lot of reflection. The artists that I talk to in their studios around the world are using this time very productively, and it's a very creative time. Um, the pause button sometimes is creative. Sometimes it gets you going around in horrible circles 
<laughs> and making a right mess of everything. But I think um, the 1920s in culture, and actually, I'm actually a, a huge fan of Francis Bacon, the painter, who was in, tw- in, uh, in Berlin in the 1920s. And he, he, he ran away there and was seduced by his godfather uncle. And then, but one has to, one doesn't want to romanticize it too much. He basically was a rent boy. That's how he earned his living. Um, And if you think, in one way, the 1920s wasn't that creative compared to, say, the time before the First World War, where you've got all this invention in abstraction and uh, invention. It it, it had Mondrian, Kandinsky, uh, the Fauves, and the the Futurists, (laughs) which which, um, talk about... uh, much more right wing than you, <laughs> I think they turned out to be. Um, so I think people will be, I mean, the one major movement of the 20s really was the German expressionists. And what they showed up, to my mind, people like Otto Dix or George Gross, was the incredible poverty, the cost of the war, cost of the pandemic in, in Germany. Uh, in literature, I think of, say, America with Scott Fitzgerald and the much more decadent in, in a, um, a less sort of, um, but that, you know, that's just generalizations. But talking to artists, I feel there will be many people who will take a much more considered benefit and will, will come back out fighting with new, new ideas. For, for the world. Not to say that these serious artists won't want to go out partying like me. Benjamin, we, you're muted. Thank you. Um, so I'd love to jump on to Edward uh, and uh, hear your uh, exciting views about the coming decade. Well, um Hmm. Exciting. You know, um, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. And there's nothing new under the sun. We all know that. So, um, yes, we can compare the 20s to other 20s. Uh, we could also compare uh, the, the 1920s to 1820s. That was also... Um, an interesting decade, a decade, uh, bef- decade after the war. Um, although, I mean, maybe not a decade fo- immediately following the war, but um, I, uh, I will not talk about things that I don't feel comfortable about talking. Like, uh, well, I could speak about art or politics uh, or social organization, but um, I think that from the uh, from the technocratic perspective uh, progress is inevitable and uh, everything that we do uh, everything that we're doing uh, lately is um, is just continue everything all the technology's effect on society is this continuous drive to get uh, atoms to move as close to the speed of bits as possible so we are instantly here uh, we're uh, communicating with each other, and uh, um, the and, and we're we are at this point foregoing the physical presence. I mean, this if not for the pandemic, we would have been physically present on some stage. Uh, but um, we do want to have instant access to to the world of um, atoms in the same way we have instant access to the world of bits. Uh, Uber has been. The great invention, where Uber and everything, all the all the uh, all the instant access services, have been a great um, invention of uh, uh, of the 2010s. Uh, we have this very powerful mechanism, very powerful mechanism, uh, an instrument, the phone in our hands, and uh, that phone has allowed us to access the world wherever we are. 
Uh, you press a button, you can get a car. You press a button, you can get food. Uh, you soon you will be able to press a button, you'll be able to get healthcare and uh, everything else that you that you need. So uh, I have been working for the last, I guess, ten years for sure, on uh, various um, uh, various companies that uh, have uh, a significant effect on how cities operate. And uh, uh, what I'm seeing is that we will only um, cities will become more livable uh, and uh, more roboticized, and uh, there will be faster access to to services. So we will have fewer cars in cities. We will not need as many cars. We will not need as much car ownership. That's certainly uh, certainly a big trend. So cities will become greener. Um, they uh, um, uh, they will look the European cities or the American cities will look lo- more like uh, the faster developing Asian cities. You can look at uh, Singapore or or Tokyo. Uh, in fact, uh, Tokyo I think is a is a great example. Uh, we've been um, we uh, we have seen many interesting inventions and many interesting uh, social phenomena uh, come from Japan, which is uh, which seems to be further ahead in social development uh, through technology than um, than the West. Uh, Ten years ago. We were looking at uh, these groups of Japanese tourists uh, carrying uh, carrying cameras on their necks and uh, taking pictures of each other, and uh, that seemed weird. Well, now we all do that um, all the time, uh, and uh, we are uh, if if you uh, if you go to Japan, one of the things that uh, um, makes you wonder what the future is like is not flying cars, but actually the fact that everything works. Everything is uh, just working clockwork. Nothing, nothing seems to be broken, and uh, the society itself seems to be uh, functioning uh, quite well. With the elderly being integrated into uh, into society, uh, like in no no other place, and uh, uh, we will see technologies uh, aid in that, uh, and uh, um, in, in, a, in a very very fast pace. Uh, so we will see complete transformation in how things, uh, how people shop, and how um, things are delivered to them. We're still uh, electronic commerce is uh, still just scratching twenty percent of uh, of commerce, uh, but it will be a significantly larger portion. Uh, we're seeing right now, even even over the last few months, there have been hundreds of millions, and there will be billions poured into this idea of uh, quick commerce or instant commerce, delivery, 15-minute delivery of everything, uh, starting with groceries and then health and beauty, um, and then going to fashion and other categories. We'll be able to press a button and get everything within 15 minutes. That will require change in uh, uh, in urban infrastructure, uh, making, and, and, once again, making and, and, and cities more livable. So, sorry to interrupt. Uh, um, I definitely want to give you more time to talk about the acceleration of of, of atoms and everything else you want to to, to bring up, um, I just want to bring um, finally um, Stuart into the into the conversation. And actually, I love the alleg- um, the, the uh, bringing up Tokyo, which was my home for about seven years. And, and despite everyone talking about the lost decades of Japan, I always thought there was a lot to learn from Japan. In fact, a lot of what the West is suffering from now in this debate in macroeconomic circles about inflation versus deflation mm-hmm. and central banking, uh, we were all talking about it in the 1990s uh, in Japan, which is um, quite interesting, and, and the demographic implosion mm-hmm. there as well. Um, but um, Stuart, um, mm-hmm. uh, what's uh, what's your take on uh, are we going into a thriving, roaring, or tumultuous 2020s. Well, I like I like to think that roaring and tumultuous probably go hand in hand, uh, Benjamin. But uh, look, thank you, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to, to speak in this panel. It's uh, some really interesting points of views that have been brought so far uh, forward. Uh, now, all the events I've spoken at the last decade or so, I've never had the opportunity to use the film The Great Gatsby as part of my research. Um, you know, and we're speaking today about you know, looking forward to this decade um, as a kind of repeat of what the last century's roaring 20s looked like. 
Uh, I know, uh, if I remember correctly, Jay Gatsby had been described by Nick Carraway, the film's narrator, as one of the most hopeful men he'd ever met. Now, um, I- I'm not, uh, I'm saying that Jay Gatsby, uh, but I'm very hopeful about the next decade, actually. Um, I think we have an opportunity to make an impact and see a, a decade that becomes notable for its achievements. And I think that's something we need to kind of really um, kind of try and aim and kind of look forward to in some ways. Um, it's not about one large party, I think. It's about recognising possibly, and we talked about this last night, Benjamin, you know, the pain that we're currently suffering and maybe the good times that could follow on from this. Uh, and the recent events, the last 12 months, have certainly kind of lowered the bar for most. The pandemic has offered a time for reflection, action, and I think one or two other speakers have notif- you know, notably said innovation. So when it comes to some of the largest tackles we've had to issue, you know, look at some of the issues we had to tackle, like um, at the climate emergency, for example, you know, we have this capacity to face this with the knowledge that you know, we do have the ability to combat it. Um, it definitely frames me as an optimist. And I think for many, this is a tough time, I think. And for some, it doesn't look good the years ahead. I think there's some real people that will struggle. I think social impacts are needed widely to support the change needed to try and meet the goals like the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. Um, but as an optimist, um, I'm not necessarily a futurist. And I think even though I look forwards, I kind of live for today. I very much see the kind of carpe diem as a way of being able to start this going forward. In my area of, of um, I kind of work in responsible finance, we see this as a kind of a critical component to look at the Im- humanitarian impact of everything we do. And it's kind of recognising that finance has that role of being kind of the first domino to fall. So without this, I think much we want to achieve in the next decade basically wouldn't be achieved. So to summarise, yeah, the question at hand, I think, yes, I think we have the chance to make this in your own 20s. Um, a vision with purpose, I think, understands the difference between, I think, probably what was slightly more hedonistic times in the 1920s to this decade, focusing on perhaps cleaning up our acts and enjoying the benefits of that. Uh, I heard a speaker earlier, actually, a couple of hours ago, talking about this. And he said we need to be more conservers than consumers and how we also need to rebuild the trust in society. So I think our aims need to be clearly on the challenges at hand to achieve this. Now, in my view, uh, and from where I sit, you know, the financial institutions um, and the kind of treasuries of the governments as well have a very influential role in this. Um, however, they still also have some of the lowest trust in society that has ever existed. So... To make this a decade of roaring success, we need to think of it not as a uh, maybe a repeat of what we enjoyed 100 years ago. Uh, some of us did or didn't. No, not any of us actually enjoyed it, did we? Um, but actually to reframe this with the opportunities at hand and try and design a decade that we'll still be able to enjoy, uh, I think, but for the right reasons. Back to you, Benjamin. Thank you, Stuart. Um, wonderful remarks. And we had a good conversation yesterday about donut economics, which I think the two of us agreed was one of the few... Just in case you ask a question, yeah. Yeah, the textbooks <laughs> look useful. Uh, um, I came out of university feeling uh, very uh, underarmed in terms of the economics I'd learned and felt like I had to learn it all again. So um, uh, donut economics, I thought was beautiful. Um, would um, um, My suggestion is we um, dip in again for anyone that wants to make some remarks. Um, we also actually have a phenomenal number of people uh, that have put their hands up and would like to ask questions. So if, if anyone that would like to um, sort of continue their remarks or reflect on what others have said, I'd love to hear your voice in no particular uh, order. Um, um, uh, I, I would love to um, ca- uh, take up something that Edward said about progress and technology uh, been a natural progress. Um, Francis Bacon, who lived through the 20s in Berlin, said, I don't believe in progress. And I think, on the whole, if you don't believe in progress, you're in a much better place. Change is wonderful. And, but the, the, the simple line of progress is one of the things that's held us back so much. And I, I think... Uh, Anyone who believes in one system is in a deep problem, problematic position at the moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Karen? Would- I, think, I, think it's, uh, I think it really depends on how you define progress. Yes. Um, and uh, I, I, if, you, if you follow any uh, social definitions, I, I absolutely agree. But uh, if you follow a physics definition of uh, progress being the exchange of energy and information, it is inevitable. 
And uh, it's very hard to argue with laws of physics. I like that. H.G. Wells was one of the first to talk about the world brain and, uh, and like Talad de Chardin, who talk about the newosphere and this, all this information circulating around the planet. I, I feel, at least from that perspective, there's been progress. But um, I also see a lot of trouble on the horizon, being an ex-investor, a macro-investor, uh, with uh, th this huge bubble that I think has been created, the ecological crisis and various other things. But um, um, would you like to add anything, uh, uh, Karen? I guess I, I'm not going to argue with the laws of physics, but I do, if uh, the, the circulation of energy and energy doesn't necessarily mean that it is a global circulation, I'm sort of struck, myself included, that we all talked about uh, developed economies essentially fundamentally underlying our worldviews. Uh, and yet we have the uh, it, technology brings with it probably a halt to export led growth as a reasonable development strategy. And that leaves me wondering what who what happens to today's frontier economies? How do they find their path forward when they're subscale uh, not India with its own self-generating uh, dynamics. I look at, I live in the United States and I look at the dynam the political dynamics here, the, uh, an economy that's 50.1% against 49.9%. And yes, there may be technological advance, but that doesn't seem to be advancing our communication uh, or, or welfare in a meaningful way. And so I think, you know, I, I guess I don't call myself a techno skeptic, but I, I do find what Alistair just said about uh, the difference between advancement and, and progress. I, that wasn't what you said. So it's a poor paraphrase, but uh, it, it struck me as uh, um, an unfortunate reflection of my own uh, concerns. Um, but I'd love to be convinced by other panelists or by audience members to be more optimistic. Yes, um, Simone, do you have any any thoughts? Yeah. Yes, um, I, I would like to link what I just heard uh, with something which occurred when I listened to um, Edward because he he said the interesting thing is that looking 100 years ago, today many things now simply work which they dreamt of 100 years ago. What, but what the interesting thing is that in the current situation of the pandemic, we realize that many things we, th we thought were working were super normal and, and there, like health systems, like, like education, like, well, we try to solve poverty and so on, are not. So, uh, and are not, uh, I mean, they are not, it's not that they are not there. We, we reached, we, we, we have, um, we were able to to develop a lot of things, but now we realize that they that the system is disrupted, and there are a lot of systems failures. And it's not that the pandemic itself is is a, a disruption, but it shows us what we have to repair in many fields of our society anyway, which we haven't done for many years, which we simply ignored. So now we realize the problems we have in education, in health system. In um, well, in inclusion, uh, human rights, uh, injustice, and all of this, and everything is has to be uh, looked at at a global scale, which also is so clear now. And I, I think that um, the pandemic in this way is, is something which helps us uh, to, to get to the next level after realizing that we have reached a lot of things, that we are really happy that we are 100 years far ahead what, from what we have dreamt of, we have now realized, and we now live in this world, but still a lot of things are not well enough. And how can we improve? And so my, my idea is that, or my hope is that we are able to get to a co-creative mindset now and start doing what, filling the gaps instead of, People tend, some people tend to think, well, somebody failed, they failed, we need a new one solving for our problems, which is not, which is a populistic way of thinking uh, of governance, which is not what I hope is was not, will not be successful these days. Because I think that it's a situation now, um, 
where we have to start co-create together, mm. uh, integrate everybody. There has, there could be done so many things in the neighborhood everywhere, um, to improve the, the situation we have. And there are a lot of good examples. We have seen that the, in the last month how people start helping each other. So many uh, social innovations coming up, uh, which just is a good signal for me that there is potential and that there is a lot of motivation. And I hope that this is, will not be lost in the next weeks or months when we still are in the middle of this COVID pandemic. Mm. Yeah, I... I um I really believe in a, a more participatory democracy. And I, I was mentioning uh, to Karen about Small is Beautiful, the, the book. And, and it, it's my view that when I heard uh, various eminent scientists, and I, I don't know if you recollect, at the turn of the century, there was a plethora of think tanks, existential think tanks that materialized. So obviously people started thinking even big bigger picture but um the um the doomsday clock started getting closer to 12 you had these think tanks at princeton and oxford cambridge etc etc talking about the end of the human race and the ecological crisis intensifying and my take when people ask me am i positive or negative about the future and I, I think this tumultuous period will last a bit longer than we think but we'll we'll end up in a, a much more positive space. Um, but I, I think one of the key things is that we start to replicate nature more. Um, and we understand how nature works. It very, we, we've put efficiency ahead of resilience um, as for decades and decades through globalization. And that's why I think it's, it's failing to a certain extent. And I think we need to go a little bit more bottom up which is why I'm excited by some of the new technologies that are all bottom up and decentralized, like 3D printing, blockchain, et cetera. But I, I would be keen to give some power back to the people. Um, I know um, I know we had a little bit of a discussion yesterday uh, with, with Stuart, who was actually a local councillor. Um, but get, given the quality of some politicians, he wasn't so excited by my idea that we should give power back to the people. Um, but uh, I don't know whether you had any any thoughts, Stuart. And then, yeah. then I want to go back, to, then I want to, go back to, te to technology if we can. Yeah, no, I'm just on that basis. I mean, yeah, I think that the point I raised, I think, at the end of our conversation, Benjamin, was very much that, you know, whilst a lot of people would like to think that we could live in a world without politicians, uh, I, I think I quoted to you that uh, one of the CEOs of a local uh, council, you know, so a civil servant of type, you know, I was talking to once said, yes, it would be it would be lovely in one way, but actually the, the politicians oil the machinery of government. And in fact, I think that's one way of looking. Nothing probably would get done because they need somebody to be accountable for that. So the accountability is important. Uh, and I, I think that's that's very common. I, one point I think I want to pick up and it's kind of filtering through from some of the other areas people are mentioning is that. You know, here, here we are, six people with a, a reasonable level of knowledge and understanding of society and the impacts and issues around us. And what we mustn't forget, and I think this comes back to your bottom up perspective, is that we need to reflect this back out to the wider community, to the wider society. That, you know, whilst I sit here in my office in the centre of the Cotswolds in the UK and England, having a, you know, and there are people walking up and down here who are in not understanding that, not understanding necessarily the impact they could have as an individual or their kind of local society around them. And I think there's a, a big piece around the cultural perspective that needs to be done as opposed to just the, the finances and the goals. We need to understand the cultural shift, to excuse the phrase. And then I think that's where technology, and I'd be really interested in kind of, I mean, Ed, Edward, we, we need to talk at some point. We're fascinated to kind of talk to you more about some of the perspective you brought forward around the technocratic perspective. I think there's a real shift coming here. And I see it in my children. You know, I see it even in my parents. You know, I think there's a massive shift coming here. I'd like to yeah. say uh, transformation yeah. instead of shift because yeah. this, uh, transformation okay. is more active and shift is too passive. Yes. Yeah. I, I some, some will be a shift. Some will be a transformation. Yeah. Uh, I, I, did uh, wanna, I, I just want uh, to say. Sorry. To, I'm just a bit concerned. Ed, Edward, uh, uh, I cut him off earlier and I'd, I'd really love to hear his train of thought on um, on, on his future of cities and uh, the acceleration of um, 
of, of atoms. We have a question in the chat, by the way. Just this is what I wanted to say. Sorry. Okay. Well, wonderful. Sorry. Thank, yeah. thank you so much. I mean, I, 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 uh, um, I, I have responses to what everyone has said. Uh, I like the idea of uh, resilience versus efficiency. And um, I think this is, uh, th this is something you can see in uh, some of the Asian societies, specifically in Japan, where after the stock market crash in 89, the, the country has transformed itself. It was a one-time shift in, um, um, in the way the, uh, the society operates. And um, 17 or 20 or 30 years of, uh, um, of uh, somewhat economic stagnation uh, has, uh, has really made society work. So it was a generation that um, has lived with the idea of uh, things staying pretty much the same from the economic perspective, uh, changing technologically, but uh, not too fast. Uh, maybe we could experience something like that uh, elsewhere in, in the West, but I'm, um, I, I actually think that the change will be more fundamental. And w with respect to, um, w with respect to us, uh, the challenges that our, many of our systems don't work. Well, it's good that we understand it now. Uh, we, um, we now know what to focus on. And uh, these things, every every challenge brings uh, tremendous opportunities. And we are, um, humans by nature are highly entrepreneurial. We we figure out uh, problems. We're faced with challenges and uh, we find uh, solutions. Sometimes these solutions uh, lead to unintended consequences, but uh, we do find solutions, which uh, makes me um, eternally hopeful. I mean, it's, uh, I, I guess it's it's not a, uh, it's not a technocratic or a technogenic perspective. It's a humanist perspective. Um, I, I believe in, uh, in human uh, ingenuity and in human ability to, um, to build and uh, ultimately to address challenges. Thank you. And um, yeah, thanks, Simone, for pointing out that question. Um, I think it's actually a superb way to close out and then we've only got three minutes we we really should have had an hour hour and a half designed for this um with, with so much depth of experience but um maybe if everyone could close out with um so it's from jim yuan hypothetically if you would have a crystal ball um my futurist friends hate that word but um i i'm always happy to run with it being the uh, idiot i am um would you have uh and you can use one phrase to characterize your wildest guess on a defining trend characteristic of this 20s decade. What phrase would you use? Um, so if you could come up on the spot with a phrase, wonderful. Otherwise, uh, perhaps give a, a parting remark. I think, Simone, you actually wrote something in the chat, didn't you? Yeah, I started with my first thought is co-creative systems transformation and I would like to add uh, which is em while embracing uh, virtual technologies because we are now using them so intensely and, and it seems to help to, to get more creative thank yeah. you I would say I, I would say focus on health mm -hmm. uh, health mm -hmm. of um, our physical health our mental health Mm. our um, health as a society and um, ultimately health um, of the species and, uh, and the planet. Mm. Mm -hmm. And do you think we'll have a, a roaring 20s or you have a better term, uh, Edward? Well, the roaring 20s were 100 years ago. We will have a better term in the 30s. <laughs> good, good, good answer. Good answer. I was giving you an opportunity to trademark it earlier, but um, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, I I would like to say, I'd sort of take up Simone's point in a way by saying, I think the priority is overcoming our binary sense of success and failure, mm. which is reaffirmed and confirmed by the algorithms we're using at the moment in so many of the ways we run our, our lives. 
good good answer as a as a Taoist fundamentally uh, I believe in paradox good and bad so I think it will be a, a good and bad 20s but uh, over to you Stuart I was going to say, kind of leading on to drill down more, maybe more vegetarianism and less eat meat eating or something. I don't know, but I mean, I think uh, I, I, I think you know, that, that's probably a little too kind of defined. I, I go with exactly what Ed was saying, I, and you know, I don't think you could put it better in terms of the health. I think that's a really big, big part of this. We need to we need to look outwards more and understand what this really, really means. And if there's a characteristic, it's about sitting in the year 2013 and realizing that we did make the right decisions to deal with you know, our relationship with nature. I think that's something we've got to, got to address. We just aren't getting it at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and Karen? 